of the things you know that people are often in search of is like I really want authentic kingdom community. I don't, uh, you know, I've been to church where you just attend, but I, I want, you know, if I have, if, if I need that, it's available, right? Because you know, you, you, there's a lot of that out there. You can go find good preaching and good singing and join in. That's not wrong, but. We, we are also God's a father, and so He really wants each one to experience um, authentic family, where Jesus is the center, where we can grow, we can be accepted as we are, but we can grow into Christ. Yeah, so that's that's what He wants us to experience, and so what you, as we're looking for that, one of the things you see in the New Testament is that. There was a regular inflow of, of life and ministry from the outside. Because how many of you know, um, sometimes fam <laughs> families need some outside resources to keep things on track. <laughs> um, and so that's, that's part of my role in the body of Christ. And I'll be you know, happy to serve you guys. It's not a mandatory thing. So you guys may never have me back. Or you can say, hey, you know, maybe... Maybe we, I could come back in six months, do something again, and kind of add another layer to the onion. Because <laughs> we did, we asked Andy, he didn't tell me this, but we asked Andy to serve a role for us as somebody who wasn't here all the time. And he didn't tell me until we, I invited him to come do this that he didn't want to do that until we had, he didn't want to give that serious concern until we had a relationship Mm -hmm. And so this has served multiple purposes, although that wasn't the intent of, of my asking him to come. So that. I, yeah, I brought that back up saying I kind of let that sit in my inbox because I don't want to just be, you know, my signature on some mm -hmm. legal form somewhere without a real relationship yeah, that, right. you know, it, it should be real. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. and it was kind of neat that that what ended up happening was when you guys start to pursue the, re the reality instead of just the formality, then right. I'm like, okay, now I'm, I'm, now I'm interested. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't tell me that, but that's how it shook out. Okay. Yeah. And so, Miss Rachel. This is my lovely husband, Scott. There you go. <laughs> and he, you that yeah, he's been around that. a bit. But, uh, so thank you, dude. Scott and I are very, very opposite. He hates crowds and large gatherings. So this is good, but still, I don't know. A little bit lost. Yeah. Right? You did the baseball game with us. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. That's cool. Oh, by the way, I got another date too. So cool. I got a date ready. <laughs> yeah. So I'll tell you about that. Know. What's your oh, date, Sean? Don't worry. I don't know. I have to tell him. I got it. Yeah, hopefully it's Miss Sandy. Yeah, it's uh, so that, that. Oh, you're talking about a date yeah, on a calendar? Yeah, okay, not not a, yeah. not, a not a side <laughs> thing. Uh, <laughs> make Justin and making her uh, appearance at uh, her first. Appearance in a while yes. where she drove herself yes. and walked up the ramp. <laughs> so, so that respite we had where we knew where she was all the time, that's over. All right. So last thing I'll say, um, before, well, last, last two quick things for us. So gang, um, Andy, th this is what he's doing for us is what he does full time. He's in full time ministry. He does, he does not have a congregation back at home or anything. And um, he comes when he's invited. There's, 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 he, he, he's received freely, he gives freely. If you want to support the work he does, you can give something to, directly to Andy. You can to Tina. We can send him something. You can go to his website and look. Um, but this is what he does, and he makes himself available to people pursuing the kingdom. Okay? And I also want to thank Andy and, and the Spirit of God, because you will notice, gang, when, 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 when I put the schedule together, it was just time blocks. And <clears throat> as I could be prone to do, I, I, I didn't plan, and I thought it would, it would happen as it happened. And as it turned out, it, it's really, you know, been different, <laughs> but it's been great, great, great. So today, even now, we'll make the, the transition. You know, we, we've we've sat through a number of. I was almost everybody in here was at something. Mm -hmm. 
So the question, and ultimately, is so what does this mean for us as a community? Right. What do we do now? What, 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 should, what should we? And we thought today um, um, would be a good day to now get to maybe a little foundation. But so let's let's talk about what what this means for us going forward, and, and how we can begin to be even more doers of the word and not just hearers of the word. Okay. Sure. So um, I guess. With that, a couple of things. One is, regards to giving and stuff like that, nobody here should feel any obligation towards that. Um, I'm here and I'm happy to be here. I came freely and am able to do so um, because God takes care of my needs. And some of how the way God takes care of my needs is by moving on people's hearts to give. To so this is actually not about you guys because I'm here regardless, right? I'm already here. I'm not leaving whether anybody gives a thing. So if nobody gives anything, I'm still here and I'm happy I'm here. So this is about you guys having an opportunity to bless the body of Christ with uh, other people, you know, that uh, I can go and minister freely. And so a lot of the ministry that I do is, is uh, overseas, it's uh, to um, recovering drug addicts, it's those kind of things where, you know, listen, there it's nice to be able to go and give freely and have extra time to do that. So. Um, that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is what I'd like to do today, I hope everybody kind of comes into these, uh, these meetings. Um, I, I want to talk a little, kind of recap a bit of what we've done um, in the last two days, just to give a bit of a foundation. But then um, I'd like to uh, give a bit of, of kind of a coaching sort of thing and then talk about what that could look like in the future. So um, don't expect this is going to be kind of a situation where you just sit and listen and uh, think of this as this is kind of like, I hope everybody brought their gym bags and their exercise because I'm the aerobics instructor for today because we're going to actually do some stuff together. And don't be afraid because, every, you know, nobody's professional. This is going to be a nice um, time together in the Lord, um, I think, unless you guys just go kicking and screaming, I want to go do anything, you know. So it's okay. Um, so I, here's one thing I just want to say, just in general, in terms of relationships in the body of Christ, as you have more of a relational uh, approach to Christianity, um, that's good because now you're in the position to actually fulfill Jesus's vision for the church. He said, you know, by this they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. And there's a lot of times now where people, they love their church. And what do they mean by that? Well, we love the worship service. We love the way the pastor preaches. We love the, the, the music. They have a cool youth program. But do you really know anybody there? And does anybody really know you? And like, who is like, and you might have a few friends, but that sometimes takes a lot of time. And like, do you have somebody, people that you can, who like it or not, kind of know your stuff and accept you with the love of Jesus and will also, uh, when they see it, rather than, hey, you have dirty feet, you're a dirty foot person. Instead of that, they actually say, you know, you don't have to hide those, the dirt on your feet. Um, I had to have my feet washed by Jesus. And I can, because you know what? The dirt on you isn't you. The dirt on you isn't you. You're beautiful. You're clean because of the word that Jesus has spoken. It lives in you. That's his identity for you hasn't changed. So don't be afraid. Let's let's wash that. And and then wow, you go. You know, there's that initial moment. Like I don't want you touching me. You know, you, you remember how the disciples came together? They're like, all right. Usually there's a slave around to sort of wash feet. So here's the deal. Uh, I ain't gonna ask you to touch my feet. Don't ask me to touch yours. We just keep a distance here, guys. That's what they pretty much did. It was kind of this unspoken thing. And, and that veil sort of abides over religion. And, that's, and, and guess what? That's why marriages are still falling apart. That's why pastors are falling into immorality. 
That's why people with real needs and real hurts are not able to get stronger quicker, quicker and to be able to get more free quicker because we, it, it takes someone else sometimes with a towel in their hand that Jesus intends for us to receive grace through the hands of another Christian. If I did this for you, then you ought to do it one for another. And we become towels in His hands. And most of us have, have experienced, you know, a pop in the butt with a towel, but never, <laughs> you know, a, a real a, a washing. And so sometimes church has become the place where you, you know, I can be myself when I'm at work because, you know, there, they're amazed that I cuss less than them, right. <laughs> you know, but, but, you know, but, you know, here, you know, everybody's supposed to be perfect. And so we keep each other a bit at arm's length and things like that. But um, what I found is this, is that if you just say, okay, guys, we're just going to let all our stuff hang out. Um, that we don't fellowship around our stuff. Right? We're not called together because we want to be some group therapy session of, let me tell you about how my husband treats me. That's not going to bless anybody, including you or your husband. <laughs> right? It, not, that they're not, not that there's not an appropriate place to do that, but really, here's the neat thing about it. And this is what I want to encourage people. Um, that I have seen sometimes where groups get started like this and there's openness and there's participation and somebody comes in from the outside and they sense, oh, here's a potential place where I can have a platform and I've been kicked out of this church and this church and this church because I keep trying to get them to see my particular hobby horse that I'm beating on this drum. This is what, in my mind, makes me special. and This is why every church needs to do this and nobody seems to get it, but I get it. And so I'm going to come in here to this place and I'm going to annoy the fool out of y'all <laughs> with it and try to take over and make it my thing. So how do you have freedom with stability, where it's freedom for Jesus, freedom for grace, freedom for health and holiness and the Holy Spirit without having a free-for-all that can be an open door for destruction, etc. Um, and so I want to give a couple of things, just a general um, word about discernment and relationships. Um, in Philippians, Paul uh, 1, he prays, I pray that you may, your discernment may abound still more and more so that you may approve what is excellent. So that your may, discernment may abound more and more in love so that you may approve what is excellent. So here's the thing. A lot of times we've come out of situations and people tend to, uh, who want to be discerning, they tend to look at it as mostly a negative thing. That discernment is, if it's 98% raw, right, I can find the 2% wrong. <laughs> and they think that that is discernment. And the truth is, you recognize the difference between discernment enables you to discern the difference between that which is the 98% right and the 2% wrong. But it's not because you're looking for the negative. It's because you have trained yourself to see the, what is real, what is good, what is Christ, and what is not. And so you're not mainly defensive, looking for things wrong, but you're positive. A lot of discerning people are primarily negative. And it's a fleshly manifestation of discernment. He said, I, I pray that your love may abound so that you may approve what is excellent. And if you look at what is going on in the book of Philippians, it's very subtle. But in Philippians 4, you find out that there are two leading women of that church that had come to uh, loggerheads with one another and apparently... They, they were, the whole church was being polarized and brought into this scuffle between people. 
And then Paul says, now, I, it, but listen to, from, from that standpoint, listen to how Paul, he gives himself as an example. He said, you know what? I'm here in chains uh, for Christ's sake. And there are people who are going around to, uh, to my churches that are trying to take my ministry from me to build up their own ministry, right? So he saw they had bad motives. But what did he do? He looked where, where he did see Christ at work so that he could approve that. Welcome. Y'all come on in. No, that's okay. We're right on African side. Right, yes. Yeah. Yeah. My wife is African on the inside. Okay. <laughs> if you need more, just tell me which I'll get some more. So, so, what did Paul say when he said he saw people that were trying to take over his ministry? He said, at least they have to preach Christ. Because my churches will only, they're only interested in, a, in, a, in Christ. And so that's what keeps us positive, is that we're looking not for the wrong in other people, but we're looking where do we see Jesus at work? How do we see Jesus at work in them? Because sometimes they lose track themselves. You know, they might feel downcast. And, and, and then Paul goes into Philippians 2, and he says, look, I know you've got a lot of things you disagree about. I know you got a lot of fussing and fighting, but if there's any fellowship, if there's any encouragement in Christ, if there's any, remember, look, if there's any spiritual reality of spiritual union, where places that you agree, instead of thinking that discernment is, well, here's where I disagree with you, right? Man, that kills fellowship. Here, you know what? If there's things that you agree about, things that you do see Christ, focus on these things. Make my joy complete that you would focus on those things. Because you know what? What you focus on in any relationship is what ends up taking over. If you focus on the negative in your marriage, guess what? That negative that you focus on and continually focus on, if you continue to focus on the negative, forget the fact that y'all have 50% of your, your marriage that's okay. You know, if it, you focus on that negative enough, it's going to seem like that's everything, you know, because you're going to get in a disagreement, you're going to focus on the negative, and then you go, you always. That's a lie. Right. They don't always do that. Right. You always. You never. That's a lie. If they, would, if they always and never, just like you just said, you'd have never married them in the first place, silly. And the truth is, they don't always. Are, are, but if you make them feel like you're... Like they're all bad and problems are the only thing that's real, then they're never. How are they going to feel like they? You you are ignoring my efforts to to do right by you and to show you love. Like I like I've seen that over and over where people feel so defeated, uh, either as parents or in their marriage or even children. You know, it, look at look at that. Are you focusing on the positive? So think of it this way. If you see a weed in your garden and you go out there and spray weed killer over the whole garden, you're going to kill the whole garden. But if you see a weed in your whole garden and you take good care of the fruit that's there, you might, you, you're going to allow the fruit to grow and you might even just pull the weed up. Right? Don't kill everything. And so find the good. And so Paul says that, and he says, look, the issue sometimes is humility. You need to be able to have the mind of Christ. Well, what is the mind of Christ? The mind of Christ is, you know what? He could have just condemned every one of us and pointed out all our flaws, but he didn't treat us on the basis of our flaws. He, he showed us grace and showed us value. So if Jesus did that for you, now you work out your salvation. And he's not talking about individuals. He's talking about y'all together. Live in this. Live in salvation. Because it's hard. Because that's when, you know, Jesus' Jesus's love is, I'm willing to put up with you until you understand who you really are. <laughs> right? But here's the cool thing. Then you go and look at Philippians uh, uh, 3, and you see that the big problem is legalism. That's why people do that. They're always trying to be right. 
I want to be right. That is what legalism is. It's a, I want to be right. Well, what is your right? My, I have no righteousness of my own. It's not my doctrine. It's not right. my zeal. It's not my right. upbringing. Right. It's not right. my right. opinions. It's not my study. It's not my anything. My righteousness, I count it all as dung. My righteousness is 100% Jesus. Right. And so if He's all my righteousness, he's, He can be all your righteousness too. And so then you go look at Philippians 4. Well, how does that live it out in practical? Philippians 4 is simply this. He says, whatever things are true, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are excellent, whatever things of good report, focus on those things. Mm -hmm. And so my encouragement on a relationship basis is to be, be, you know why Paul says that? Because he realizes that's God's focus towards us. He's not saying, hey, y'all do it, but God's all focused on your negative. No, he's been in the presence of the Lord enough to realize he is not focused on the 2% negative or the 98% negative. If Christ dwells in you, he's focused on your spirit. And he's trying to get you to focus on that too. Christ is your life. You're crucified with Christ. Because he wrote to the Corinthians, stinker of a church. He said, you are saints, fully righteous, washed and justified. And he could see that the power of the Holy Spirit was at work in them. So he commanded them on this. Look, you're lagging in no spiritual gift. Now, there's a lot of things that you're not getting right, but that's not who you are. Amen. So, do you, see, do you see how God, that's how God relates to us, but that's how a spiritually mature person, and so, he, so my encouragement is, be the place for each other where coming into our, your midst together ought to feel like coming to Jesus. That, you know what, other people may not understand me, but through Jesus, I get grace. I get, I get to hear the truth of God that will change me, but I get to walk in accepted. Not because I'm acceptable, but because Jesus has won my acceptance. Mm -hmm. And that I am treasured in the eyes of God because God says you're worth dying for, you're worth paying for. And so we ought to be a place together, a community where every person is treated like they're worth dying for. That even if they have wrong ideas or wrong attitudes for a time, we don't define them and their worth by their ideas or their, uh, their attitudes at the moment. But we do discern the difference between what is flesh and what is spirit, but we're looking for the spirit to stir that up and to release that and to bless one another. And, and what you find is that it's so easy to then you just, you know, you walk away from what's dead. You know, you might have come in just not having a feeling like you had a whole lot to offer, but at least this could be a place where you know, if I get there, I'm going to receive prayer and encouragement. I'm not going to get beat up or, or you know, uh, or told how wrong I am. I know I'm wrong. I just need a place I can go <laughs> to be helped so that I could be right. Does that make sense? Now, uh, so part of, part of what we've been um, talking about together in our times uh, leading up to this point was that how does that relate to, you know, church? And part of what I've been pointing out is that the essence of church life is really us participating in the life that and the fellowship that has flowed between the Father and the Son in the Spirit. That really is what church life is. It's fa Father, Son, and Spirit saying, you know, the, the love and the fellowship that we are experiencing through spiritual union of a giving of ourselves. Uh, uh, the Father shares Himself with the Son and the Son receives the Father. How? In the Spirit. And the Father loves the Son, and the Son receives the Father's love and loves the Father. How does He do that? In the Spirit. It's a flow of inmost being that He redeemed us so that we could be welcomed and hook, and He gave us the Holy Spirit so that that love could now flow in us and through us. So that's why it says in Galatians 4, 6, because you are sons, 
God has sent forth the Spirit of His Son, where? Mm. Into our hearts. Doing what? Crying, Abba, Father. So, what, what we have missed to, to a large degree is we've missed that that is the Christian life. It's entering into son, the sonship, the same relationship that Jesus has with the Father. We get that relationship extended to us. Not because we're that way by nature, but because that is what we've been adopted into. And we've been, therefore, given a new nature. Right. The Spirit of God dwells inside of us so that we can open up our hearts to, to take that position of, okay, I, I was just reading this morning. You guys have read the Old Testament, and, and you know there's all those big elaborate instructions about how the priests are to wear, to dress. Do you know that God didn't do a background check to see if Aaron and his sons have been naughty or nice? He said, sacrifice cleanses them, now you consecrate them and they wear a robe. Because they come into my presence clothed. And, they, and, the, and the clothing is glorious and beautiful. Do you understand that you are clothed with Christ in the presence of God? That His blood has made a way for you to enter in. And everything you are apart from Christ was crucified 2,000 years ago. And so you step in to who you are for eternity. Praise God. Mm. You are not what you were born with. You are what you were born again with. Amen? Your parents and your upbringing do not determine who you are. What you do apart from Christ on the basis of that life that you were born with from your mom and dad and from Adam and Eve, right? That life isn't who you are, that the life that you receive from Christ. Christ is your life. Galatians chapter th or Colossians 3, 4. When Christ, who is your life, is revealed. So we need to learn, if God says that about us, we need to learn to say that about ourselves. So, that said, all right, now part, the other part of that, that's where the essence, that's the wellspring, right? You abide in Christ, then Christ abides in you. Well, so if you begin to realize, you know, uh, I'm not feeling or looking or acting a whole lot. I'm not seeing a lot of Christ come out of me right now. Don't strive. Well, i got to try harder to make Jesus come out of me. You need to make every effort to enter back into that rest, right? right? That's the effort, is you abide in Christ. And then as a natural outflow, you know, think of it this way. You are what you eat, right? So if you find that you're getting hangry, Right? You're, you're, you're angry and hungry at the same time. Why? Because you're empty. Do you try to, do you try to act nicer or do you just go get something to eat? <laughs> you see what I mean? And so you can try harder to white knuckle a better attitude and still be empty, but it's a lot easier, you know, especially when you're pregnant, right? <laughs> just get me a pickle and ice cream, you know, <laughs> or whatever. And you, you eat it, and being filled, it's a lot easier, you know. And that's, that's the whole thing, is that sometimes we're trying to get ourselves to act like Jesus and to, be, to act like we're filled with Jesus instead of just get filled with Jesus. And then you don't have to act. Right. You see what I mean? And so part of what goes with this, Jesus didn't expect for us to get that merely through preaching. It's the starting place, but preaching should be in a context of disciple making. Do you understand? So most of us have heard sermons, but how many of us have been able, have been mentored? Have had someone who's come alongside of us outside of from behind the pulpit to say now you heard what i spoke to everybody but i'm going to take a personal interest in you and say now how's that working out in your in your life and, and, and help let me help you and where are you and here's what i mean let's do that together right and so there's two things that need to be recovered and they're really one one is uh, you know lot, the christian life as participating in the life of the son that's the spiritual essence of it. 
then how does that practically work its way out? Well, sons, naturally, they, they just create family, right? Son is a family word. Father is a family word. And so the essence of church, if, if God were a CEO, then church would be a business, right? If God were mostly a, a public speaker, then it would be a, 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 a sermon. But he's a father, and so a father will speak into our lives. A father, you know, he runs the business of the family. There's a budget there. You know, all of those things are part of family. Uh, but the essence of family is relationship. And the strength and the wisdom that I have in me, you know, I'm not going to judge you by it. Because I see that you don't have it. Because what a father does... They don't judge their children. They see where their children are and what they're lacking. A father pours into them what they're lacking. You know, when my kids came out of the womb and couldn't walk, I wasn't disgusted with them. And I didn't think, well, they must not have the gift of walking. <laughs> and just, you know, especially like when they first started to walk, you know, they took two steps and crash, you know. I was excited about the two steps. I didn't worry about the crash. And you know what? We ought to be that way for one another. We ought to be that way. Praise God. I saw Jesus there. He's working in you, even if he didn't come all the way out of you. Praise God. It's growing. Let's focus on what's growing. Let's nurture them. Do you see the difference? So this is kind of all relating. I'm trying to prepare you guys to not slaughter each other when, I'm take, when I encourage you to begin to disciple one another, to be disciples of Jesus, okay? Do you see what I mean? Because you need to be, to be uh, reflective of that heart and pursuing that heart together. But my encouragement is this, is that... It's what the institutional church has done largely is that they have taken the preaching ministry that's legitimate of the kingdom and they have taken people who are born again, which is legitimate, and assembled them mostly just to listen to sermons. And so instead of making disciples, they end up making attenders. Even though they're spoken aim is to make disciples but the way jesus made disciples was yes he preached but he lived with 12 guys and he you know had conversation and relationship and and he could see he could listen to their conversation and say you know what you guys are fussing over who's the greatest and there's something you don't get and who's got a baby around here all right yeah see this baby that's how great y'all are going to be you don't get any more authority or rank than this child. The way that we're going to do it is this. That the way they do it out in the world is somebody outranks somebody else. That's the way it always is. But the way we're going to do it is this. Y'all are all going to have the same amount of rank as a baby. That means you're going to be rankless. But... Here's the deal. It's not that you're not going to be leaders because I'm training you up for that. But here's the way that leadership works in my kingdom. You serve. Right. You take greater responsibility. If you want influence in people's life, it isn't going to be because I'm going to set you up as their boss. It's because you're going to answer my call to love them and to, to wash them and to give your life up for them. You're going to take greater responsibility to serve them. And if they choose not to listen to you, you know what? It's not about you. Don't pull rank. You point to me. Because if they receive you, they'll receive they receive me. It's about me. You, right. you get yourself out of the way, right? And Paul said that. He said, listen, I don't preach myself, but Jesus Christ is Lord. And myself is your bond slave for Jesus' sake. And people willingly listened to Paul and deferred to him and, and saw what he was carrying and they received that for themselves, not because he was trying to get something up over on them. They, they just sensed, you know, and that's the way God's power is. He uses his power to give us something to empower us and set us free. The enemy is always trying to use power uh, over people. 
get something over on them and force you to do what you don't want to do, but you've got to do it because otherwise I pull the levers around here. You're going to be out on your ear, you know. But it's not so among us. Praise God.